Good afternoon. I'm Dr. Doug Evans, Chair of the Department of Surgery at the Medical College of Wisconsin, and welcome to our weekly series on updates and innovations in the Department of Surgery. Today I'm lucky enough to be joined by David Joyce, one of our uh, newer cardiothoracic surgeons, and the topic for today is cardiac surgery, and we're also going to cover a little bit on heart transplant, um, circulatory support. We're going to introduce a few of those topics. Uh, David is a graduate of the United States Air Force Academy. He went to Harvard Medical School, did his surgery training at Johns Hopkins University Hospitals, and his cardiothoracic uh, training at Stanford University. Uh, he recently came to Milwaukee from the Mayo Clinic, and David, we're thrilled that you're here. Well, thank you, Dr. Evans. Pleasure to be here. And maybe we can start a little bit by uh, talking about uh, uh, heart failure, what actually that is, and then what are the, when the heart starts to uh, poop out, if you will, mm -hmm. then what, what are the surgical options or the or that might lead up to a heart transplant. I think that would be a great way to start. Absolutely. So, you know, we've all heard this term heart failure, and to be honest with you, even in, in medical terms, it's kind of hard to define. And for patients who have it, they may not even know about it because it happens slowly over a gradual period of time, but it, it's kind of uh, defined by shortness of breath. Sometimes people can get swelling in their extremities, and, um, and again, they may not even realize how bad their symptoms are until things get pretty severe. But eventually what happens is the heart sort of goes into this downward spiral and people get to the point where even with medicines, they have a hard time maintaining normal activities and so they get admitted to the hospital. Now why, why doesn't, um, where does bypass surgery come into play and you know, does everyone who gets heart failure, have they already had a bypass operation? That's an excellent question. So, so what we think about with heart failure is sort of the common final pathway that people get into with any kind of heart disease. So it could be bypass. It, I mean, it could be a coronary disease that progresses, goes to a bypass operation, maybe a few stents, and then eventually that disease just continues to spiral despite all these interventions that we do and the heart fails. Could be a valvular problem. Could be that we do a repair or a replacement of one of the valves and then over, again, many, many years, the heart continues to struggle. Sometimes we don't even know what it is. Sometimes people have never even had any treatment on their heart, but they just start having these symptoms and the next thing you know, it's gotten to a point where it's severe enough that we have to think about some of the really serious options that we have to, to try to fix it. So you start out with medicines. Correct. And the cardiologist would typically do that. That's right. And then when would the cardiologist get you involved, either with some type of assist device mm -hmm. or with uh, considering uh, being put on the transplant list? So usually once they've exhausted all the kind of less invasive types of therapies, they'll, and, and when somebody has pretty significant symptoms, they'll, they'll call us for either one of the devices which can support or even replace the heart or just do a heart transplant. And those are kind of the two broad categories that we think about as surgeons for how we can try to fix the heart. And you know, it's interesting, heart failure is, is a really serious problem. I mean, when, when I think about uh, your practice in pancreatic surgery, you know, when I think about if I knew I had a pancreatic cancer, I would want to come see you right away. I mean, I wouldn't want to delay. But with heart failure, people sometimes don't have that same urgency. It doesn't seem as scary as a cancer would be. And yet it can be when you're in the advanced stages, it can have a worse outcome and a wor worse prognosis, even than some of these terrible cancers. So once things get to kind of that stage. And how, just in general terms, how would a patient know right. that, they're, that they're kind of getting us at getting to the point, because obviously they're relying on their cardiologist That's to right. make that opinion. But in, in general terms, when, uh, what is the phenotype or what does the patient yep. look like who you end up seeing? So it's, it's hard, it, unlike most of the conditions that I treat, which it's a very well ironed out echo finding or some other kind of sure. real easily defined process, it's hard to uh, come up with a real easy definition for that. But I think a general rule of thumb, is if somebody's got, gotten admitted to the hospital, and, and certainly if it's happened more than once or twice in a year, and, and the reason for their being admitted is for heart failure, they're in the zone now where probably they should at least have a chat with me. Now, it might be another year or two, or, or maybe they'll be able to be managed with less invasive treatments and they won't need to see me, 
But by, even by the time they're in that hospital once or twice with a heart failure symptoms within a year, that's, that's actually when they're starting to get into that zone where there's, there's danger there if they don't sure. get treatment. They probably ought to be thinking about seeing not only a heart failure cardiologist, but even somebody like me who can perform some of these operations that we can offer. So I think we'll, we'll get to heart, the replacement of the heart in a minute. Mm -hmm. Maybe you could explain to our audience a little bit about the, um, about the devices that are used to make the heart function better short of a complete replacement of the heart with a donor organ. Exactly. So in, everybody remembers from biology class that there's four chambers in the heart. But for those of us who work in the specialty of heart failure, we really just think about it as right side and left side. And so the right side pumps blood to the lungs, which as you can imagine, they don't have to travel very far. It doesn't require a lot of pressure. And the left side of the heart pumps the rest of the body. And that's a lot more work. And so believe it or not, probably 95% of the time, the left side of the heart is the one that really has the most trouble and that fails. And although early in our experience with treating this condition, we always tried to fix both sides, we've gotten to where now we've realized that really what we really need to do is just assist the left side. We don't even have to replace the heart or, or take over for the heart's function. We just have to give it a little bit of help. And so we do that with something called a left ventricular assist device. And that's a really small little pump that we implant. We can insert it right into the sac that fills right around the heart. And that will actually suck the blood out of the heart, or out of the left side of the heart, and then reroute it back into the aorta, which is the big blood vessel where the blood gets uh, pumped through. And it, what, what, um, what operates that? I mean, is it battery powered? Do you plug it into it is. It's, a, it's a, about a 10 watt uh, power draw. So unfortunately, unlike a pacemaker where we can just make a little pocket and stick a little battery in there, this is a little bit more heavy duty. And so yeah. that's the one thing that uh, is a little bit intrusive for some patients is that there is a drive line that we have to bring out of the body down here in the abdomen. And then that hooks into a little pack that people can wear that has some batteries that they change out. And believe it or not, by the time you're in advanced heart failure, your symptoms are usually so severe that the even having that little pack uh, to carry around with you turns out to be a massive quality of life improvement because you yeah. feel so much better, your shortness of breath goes away, and you live longer. So Because the heart is basically pumping more blood out to the brain, to the rest of yes. the body, so the patient is much more functional. Absolutely. Okay, and, and basically that power pack then gets plugged into the wall, or how does it get recharged? So there are batteries that can be exchanged, okay. and then there is also the option of plugging it directly into the wall. But, but for most patients, they'll have a number of batteries that they just switch out throughout the day. And so they, almost like a, a, it's a Tesla of the heart. It is, exactly. Yeah. We're not quite as fancy yet, but that day will come too, I think. And that's one of the things we're looking at in the lab right now is some energy sources that might wow. make that a little more user-friendly. So Now, does, does everyone go through the stage of a left ventricular assist device or an LVAD before they get a transplant or otherwise termed everyone who gets a transplant, have they, do they already have an LVAD in place? Not everybody, but it's becoming more and more common. And the way that, in a general sense, and it's probably more complicated than what I'm gonna make it, but if you need a transplant, in general, there's kind of three different statuses that we think about in terms of how those organs are prioritized. So the highest status, the people who are, are probably likely to get their organ first, are people who are so sick that they're actually in the hospital, in the ICU with lines in and drips running in. And these are people that are really, they have maybe weeks or months to live if we don't get an organ for them. And many times those are patients who for various reasons aren't eligible for one of these devices or for other reasons, you know, don't have a device. Sure. Then the patients who we talk about who go home and they live their life and they kind of just enjoy having better quality of life with one of these LVADs, those comprise the next level of priority. That's what we call 1B. And uh, those patients oftentimes will wait a couple of years, but you know, it's just a matter of getting enough time on that waiting list so that they can get a transplant. And then finally, there's a, a status two that also exists. That's the third rung on the priority list. And to be honest with you, those are very infrequent nowadays because the donor limitation is so severe. There just aren't enough hearts to go around. That's right. There just aren't enough, to, uh, enough donor hearts. That's right. So until you're sick enough to qualify for one of those first two things I mentioned, it's, it's unlikely. I mean, it happens every once in a while, but sure. pretty rare. Now, I, I know en enough about this to be probably a little bit inaccurate, but a uh, heart transplant is even more complicated than, for example, liver or kidney transplant in that you have to have, there are size issues. That's and right. Well, maybe you can talk a little bit, especially for those 
people who have a, a loved one on a on a um, on a, a list waiting to get a heart, mm -hmm. and they're obviously frustrated and concerned that that a, a, a donor heart has not come along. Maybe talk about the complexity of matching yep. the the right heart to the right the right donor heart to the right recipient. Yeah, this is a very very challenging part of this uh, specialty, and actually we just published a paper that's looking at a risk calculator that looked at a statistical model basically that could try to help us to make that decision. But at the end of the day, even with all the fancy computer modeling, there is nothing that is really going to tell you whether when a donor offer becomes available, is that going to be the right fit for that patient that's on the waiting list? And so that's, a, that's probably one of the most complicated things we do in modern medicine. And so the way that we have found that works the best for, for tackling that is actually, uh, it goes back to something that was recently talked about in this book, The Wisdom of Crowds, and it's a, it's a popular concept, but it's the idea that a group of us who are experts can probably all work together to make a better decision about something than just one of us. Even if, even if I'm the smartest guy in the room, I'm not as good as everybody else in the room working together to make that decision. And so the, the classic story is there was this uh, county fair and they had an ox and they tried to guess what the weight was. So they had 800 people guess the weight of the ox and some of them were probably better than others. But when they averaged the guesses of everybody in that county fair, they were within one pound. It was 1,197 pounds and it was only one pound off from the actual weight of the animal. That's how it is for us when we get one of these organs. When we work together, and this happens 100% of the time. There's cardiologists, there's myself. Sometimes there's infectious disease issues. If a patient, the donor had an infection that we're worried about, we'll call one of those uh, colleagues to come in. Sometimes there's genetics issues that we have to figure out. And so none of us has all the expertise to be able to make that decision all by ourselves. But as a group, I think we do a pretty good job. Wow. Well, maybe I know this is a very hard thing to do to explain. Um, how you would do a heart transplant, but maybe in general terms, because I think it is such an abstract thought to our audience, most of whom have never been in an operating room, never mind uh, seeing a heart operation with the, with the right. sternum opened. Um, but maybe you could just briefly talk about um, how you take the heart out. You obviously have to put the person then on bypass, right. and, then, and then a couple uh, uh, things that you've acquired over the last couple of decades on, on how to put the heart back, the new heart in. Absolutely. So I like to think about, I mean, at the end of the day, cardiac surgery is real simple. I mean, everything we do is just, it's, it's unbelievably simple. And so with transplant, it couldn't even be any simpler. You're going to take a brand new donor heart, usually young, healthy donor, and you're going to put it in the place of the other heart. And so once you know you've got to do that, everything else just kind of falls into logical place. So obviously if we're gonna sew that heart in there, we gotta get in there somehow. And we've tried all the different incisions and there's lots of different ways you can do that, but it turns out just taking a saw, sounds a little barbaric, but believe it or not, not very painful. Uh, most people only need a Tylenol by a week after surgery once we've done something like this. But we divide the sternum and we put in a, spread, a rib spreader, or a, a sternal retractor that sure. basically opens up that area where the heart is. And now we have just great ability to see what's going on. And, and now if we wanted to, we could cut out the heart and sew the new one in. But of course, uh, if we did that, it would get very bloody. And so we've got to have a way to try to uh, keep the blood flowing to the body as we remove the recipient's heart. So to do that, we use uh, the heart lung machine. And so that's basically a pump that kind of sits over at the side of the bed and we hook one cannula in that goes into that aorta that I talked about where the oxygenated blood pumps around to the body, goes to the brain, goes to the kidneys, all the organs to see just essentially normal blood flow like we would have right now just sitting here talking. And then once we've done that, we can put a clamp on where the, where the aorta feeds into the heart and then we can actually just cut it out. And so we do that. And the, you have another, another tube that that That's drains right. the that the, drains the, the blood deoxygenated blood That's coming right. back to the heart. Then it goes into the machine and gets oxygenated and pumped back in. So the so for the period of time that that patient is on the heart lung machine, they no longer are dependent on their own heart or their own lungs. And so we could, in fact, sometimes we'll do a heart lung transplant. We'll transplant all three organs mm -hmm. in the same operation with just the help of that machine. So it really buys us some time to be able to go ahead and, and sure. do what we need to do, which is really just cut it out and sew the other heart in. And, and really, again, I don't, I don't mean to make it sound, you know, simpler than it is, but it's really just, you know, 
cutting, a, cutting out at certain places where we know it's easy to sew and then taking a suture and sewing it back in. It's not, it really isn't rocket science. So, uh, so you sew it with a, with a needle and thread. That's exactly right. And things yeah. are put back in. And what, what are some of the things, what are some of the challenges in the patient recovering? They obviously need some degree of immune suppression. That's right right, because it's not their organ, it's another organ, so they require immune suppression and they're monitored in the ICU on average for how long usually? Well, it depends a little bit on how sick they are going into the procedure, and so, and, and that's one of the reasons we like these LVADs so much, is because they kind of take over and, and create this artificial environment where the patient, even though they're in terrible heart failure, their other organs haven't figured that out yet. And so for those patients, you know, usually we can get them out within a couple days from the ICU, and usually within a couple of weeks they're ready to go home if everything goes well. But on the other hand, if a patient has some degree of end organ damage, so their kidneys aren't working as well, or their lungs are a little bit, uh, have a little bit of high blood pressure, or they have other organs that are kind of not maybe as perfect as they could be, each of those things can kind of. So that's a great some, point. So it's, it's almost a little counterintuitive. Mm -hmm. Then the patient who, ha who may have actually the worst heart, mm -hmm. and they therefore have an LVAD or left ventricular assist device helping their heart the rest of their body may actually be stronger and That's better. Right. That's right. Because it's getting more oxygen and more blood. Exactly. Yeah, and so uh, it's a little bit more challenging, obviously, when you've got one of these devices in there because there's a lot of scar tissue, and so there's a, a, the operation becomes a little more complicated. It's not just as simple as I made it sound where you just cut out the heart. You've got to spend maybe some time, hours maybe, getting the, getting the heart dissected free without injuring any sure. of the other structures in there. So it makes our job a little bit more difficult in the procedure, but well worth it once you get them through it, and then you're, you're dealing with other organs and, and everything else being much more healthy. I think one of the, one of the things that uh, people have talked about here on this campus is, uh, in addition to the beautiful operating rooms, is that there's a dedicated intensive care unit just for the cardiac patients. Absolutely. And there's, a, there's an intensive care unit doctor specialist there 24 hours a day. That's right. Maybe you can talk about the, the potential uh, benefits of having that. I'll tell you, of all the things that impressed me about this place when I first visited here, that was very high on the list of things. Not just the facilities, which as you say, are, to my mind, I don't know that there's another facility that can compare just in terms of the high-tech uh, environment with, you know, brand new, brand new rooms, private rooms, the whole nine yards, but, mm -hmm. but the team really. I mean, it really comes down to the fact that we, we have a phenomenal group of intensive care doctors who each understand all these complexities of every possible thing that can go wrong. And the communication between myself and them, I, I have to tell you, I probably spend more time texting these guys than I do my wife, I have to confess, because there's always little things that come up in the ICU and they wanna just be sure that we're on the same page about it. And so, you know, we enjoy kind of having that sort of dialogue all the time to make sure that a patient is, is progressing like we would like them to. So. Wonderful. Well, David, thanks so much. This Thank has you. been fantastic. I know that uh, many, of the, many of the people who are watching this video uh, will either have a heart issue themselves or their family members may have a heart issue, and I think this has been uh, incredibly enlightening. Uh, for those of you who are watching us today, uh, there'll be more information just to follow the end of this video on Dr. Joyce, uh, how to contact him if you would like to communicate directly with him. Thanks so much for listening. Thanks.